Hey, legends, we are keeping the AFL trend running as we get to the pointy end of the season. Today, we have Collingwood forward Dan McStay on. He has lived a crazy last eight months. If you think about the MCL he did just before the grand final, missing out on the grand final win, doing an ACL and missing a chunk of this season. He's been through a washing machine of emotions. His mind and strategies going through it all has just been uh, incredible to listen to and speak to. We go through his time at Brisbane. He played with Jonathan Brown on the back end of his career. He experienced Lockie Neal winning a couple of Brownlows. He's also played with Charlie Cameron. He had a great career at Brisbane. But also he gives us insight into the trade period as well of what happened to coming to Collingwood and his time of how he's loving it there, playing for one of the biggest clubs in the land. This was a great podcast, guys. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the Unlaced Podcast. As I always say, if you are new here, thank you for turning up and if you've come back again, I absolutely love you. Guys, if you are tuning in on Spotify, please take this time out to pause and give us a review. Five stars if you're feeling friendly, we'd love you for that. Just to get our review numbers up, if you guys haven't subscribed uh, subscribe to YouTube, uh, followed us on our Instagram or TikTok pages, give us a follow, guys. We'd absolutely love it. Um, some of the clips we've been producing this year with Braden and team and Harrow, we'll give Harrow a shout out. He's been doing a lot of the groundwork as well. Um, have been absolutely awesome. So if you guys can follow us on those channels, we'd absolutely love you for your support. We are running heavy on AFL because it's that time of year, the pointy end of season. And I'm very, very happy uh, to have here with me today. Collingwood forward, Dan McStay. Dan, mate, welcome. Thanks for having me. Are you a forward? Like, is that a fair term? You, put, I mean, you kind of play can play everywhere. Yeah, I started my career probably my first like 70 or so games, which I don't know if people even really know that. I was a back. So. Were you really? Yeah. So when everyone like always says, oh, you know, you've only kicked this amount of goals or whatever. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, that's probably fair. But I also <laughs> played majority of my um, start as a, as a defender. So yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, does, does that actually help going forward at all? Like, cause I know that that happens quite a bit. Like even how we pop forward a few weeks back and stuff like that. I mean, the, you kind of know how people think, I guess. Yeah. Um, they, they always talk about that. Like, you know, learn how good forwards play or play on good forwards and learn what they do. And then you can use that as um, as a way of um, bring that into your own game going forward. So, um, yeah, it definitely helped me. Um, I don't know if defending 80 inside 50 as a game was, uh, was helpful. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. we used to get absolutely smashed um, early days at the Lions, but um, I definitely probably got gifted some games and um, that would definitely gave me a lot of confidence in um, and experience um, yeah. early days, which, uh, you know, if I had gone to a good team, you know, you probably would have just played um, – in the second level for, a, you know, a number of years before you even got your what chance. Are the, what is it? Is it playing the NEFL? The it used to be NEFL. Now, now they've all combined it to the VFL. And, oh, do they really? They, yeah. So they come down. So Brisbane and Gold Coast and um, Sydney, they're all part of the, the VFL now, which is just ironic. Hey, it's good to um, see you back out there. That's for sure. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a bit of a journey. But, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's just good to kind of feel like, everything you've done and all the work you've put in um, has kind of led to some sort of reward. Um, yeah. It's not always the case. Um, <laughs> I'll figure that out the hard way, but, um, yeah, it is just nice to be back out playing footy, doing what, what Where, I love. Are the Collingwood fan, I want to give you some justice to what you've been through because Collingwood, Collingwood fan, as you know, absolutely crazy, come in huge numbers. I say it all the time. You guys have grown my podcast. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we're definitely going to go into – like deeper some of those injuries, but just in regards to now, like how is it just being able to play? Like that that feel do you like have a, a higher gratitude at all or like do you know what I mean? Like oh, that just that's just that feeling of like wow. Yeah. You know? No, absolutely. Um so grateful just to man, I, like MCG is our playground. Like we're <laughs> like it's Josh, it's crazy to it? say. <laughs> like we're so lucky. Um especially Collingwood, like our fans, um you get to play in front of like world, like worldwide, like we have a huge, um, one of the highest average attendances. Dude, really? I think last year we were second behind like um, Borussia Dortmund. The, oh, bro, I've read that. What yeah, was that? Was, like, was that looks, off members or was that off? Um, uh, it was like um, crowd appearances. Yeah, average attendance. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's fuck. That's a yeah. crazy statistic. Yeah. So when you talk about like worldwide sports, like Collingwood's right up there yeah. which is which is just wild to even think about um kind of don't really know what you, what you get into when you when you can't but <laughs> yeah, yeah. that was um yeah so that we're like we're incredibly lucky to have that um and just you know majority of the, the those that attend they're on our side so <laughs> i know well that's what that's, that's probably an interesting thing to ask about the difference with brisbane and collingwood because like i'm interested and definitely want to spend time talking about the brisbane journey because arguably that's a you know a big part of 
your AFL career to this point. But just on that, like having the Gabba home advantage and then pretty much having to fly interstate every second week and actually feel at an away ground yeah. versus Collingwood where anything in Melbourne's kind of a home game. Yeah. Don't care if you're wearing white shorts, like it's, you're getting the numbers. Oh, man, we, we consider um, Marvel. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, we have to travel to Marvel. Like, damn. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it is crazy. It's um, You can't even really describe it. Like Brisbane, um, you know, the, the one good thing about – um, traveling every week. I was a gold member for Velocity, but I, I'm <laughs> yeah. actually, I'm still Have you dropped? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually. See, they're brutal with that, eh? Make it so to hard it. to get there. Share. What's going on? Is it Virgin? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Virgin. I'm, trying to earn on, that. I'm trying to earn that shit back in the moment. I've <laughs> got a few off-season trips back and yeah. forth to Brisbane yeah. and Sydney and whatever, trying to, um, yeah, bump back up to gold. But, um, yeah, like Brisbane, you know, we we play predominant of our um, – Melbourne games in at Marvel. So mm. we, we'd only play like one or two games at the G a year. Like, so everyone used to talk about, oh, they've got this MCG hoodoo. It's like, well, yeah, we only we only play there like once a year. So but that's we, not what you're doing, right? Yeah, that's what Brisbane's doing. No, nah, it's like we always play like the big teams like Carlton or Collingwood or whatever. We'd always play them um, at, at Marvel. Mm. So – I used to laugh when everyone used to be like, oh, you guys can't play the MCG. It's like, well, we don't really play there. Yeah. Like, um, during COVID, like, we did, I don't even think we played there at all. So that was like a two-year period Jesus. where we didn't really play there either. So, um, like, I don't think that Brisbane can't play at the G. I think it's just like a, like an abnorm- abnormality that we don't actually really we, – we never played there. Yeah. Um, and when we did play, I remember we played Richmond maybe just before or during their premiership run – you're playing there like in front of 80,000 Richmond fans. It's, it's a hard like place. a different sport at that point yeah. sometimes. Like yeah. it's, yeah, like yeah. it's been out of body experience playing sometimes. So you're initially coming into like those final series against big teams. Absolutely. I reckon I played back one day there and um, we'd kick a goal and you're like, oh, shit, set up, set up. Like, <laughs> you think we'd like, think we'd kick the point because you just can't hear anything. And you're just like, oh, fuck, we've obviously missed. Yeah. And you're like, oh, no, it's a goal. Like, that's, set up. That's Fine. crazy. Yeah, it's just wild. So. Um, that's a that's a bit of the disparity between, um, yeah, I guess Collingwood and Brisbane. And then obviously when you go up to the Gabba, it only holds 40, but it's a pretty loud 40, especially like once we started to get better as a team. Um, yeah, my first like four years or five years, we were kind of getting beaten pretty regularly. Like we were pretty, pretty bad team. Mm. Once we kind of started to build a team that was, um, you know, competing for finals and, and almost premierships, that was when we started to really pack out the Gabba and – it was a really tough place for teams to come. It was come cool and play. to watch, the, like seeing the back. It, it almost like the Brisbane Lions were rejuvenated again, like back to the old days of like packed house. Like the yeah. Gab is a fortress. Yeah, yeah. That we, was on the that was on the beginning of like where it was like undefeated runs against teams and undefeated up there and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We literally used to try and make it a fortress. Like we used to talk about that. Really, like yeah. how do, how can we make it really hard for teams to come and beat like come and play up here? <laughs> yeah. And um, we, we we did for a strong like. Well, they, they still are really hard to beat up there. <laughs> yeah, so. I bet. Um, that's kind of still, um, yeah, they're running with that, which is good. Is there is there actually, like, I know people talk about it, but you've lived it, like, the difference with grounds. I get, like, you don't play there as often at the MCG, say, for finals, and you may not have your packed sort of sort of fans, which which probably is the main difference. But, like, the field, I mean, it's all. The, is it the same, like, in regards to the, the size of the Gabba? Because I know the SCG, for instance, is smaller, so for Sydney it – you know, it might be a bit. It's a bigger, bigger game. Yeah, a bigger, f- bigger field as such. I feel like um, AFL is probably the one sport, or and cricket. You know, where the grounds actually do make a difference. Like if you play in soccer, That's like every point. every soccer field is you know similar or the same dimensions. I'm assuming. Yeah, like the 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 width of difference is not much. If, yeah, if yeah. they legally. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, and NBA, like all these like basketball, netball, they're they're all on like the dim- dimensions are exactly the same. Whereas AFL, you're actually playing on different size grounds. So we talk about that. Like, for example, like we played SCG this week. They Their ground's like really wide. So we're, we're talking about how we defend a wider ground and whatever. And then, um, you know, you play down at Geelong and they're like a really narrow ground. So you can kick the ball out on the full really easily. And uh, Adelaide Oval is similar, like really narrow, what? deeper pocket. So yeah, it's like- That's crazy breakdown. Yeah, I never so you, I never even thought of it like that. So yeah. it may, in your eyes, it, well, I mean, obviously you're right, but I mean, it makes a bigger difference. Yeah, it does. So especially for defense, yeah. yeah okay. um, and then offensively, how you um, move the ball. Some grounds like the G is obviously really hard to defend because it's such a, a big and wide ground. So you can actually like pick through um, defenses a little bit easier, but yeah. then- um, 
on on the um, contrary, you need to make sure that your defense is really tight because teams can open you up. Right through the middle go. of the ground. Can you can you crack uh, a myth for me, whether it's true or not? But uh, I don't know who said it, but someone always said doesn't matter, particularly for like the night games at the Gabba, but probably more so just in general. The ball's always a little bit like it's always a little bit dewy, even if it's hot. The yep. ball's a bit heavier. Yep. It like doesn't come off the hand as well. Someone told me that. Yeah, is that true? And Absolutely, like, why yeah. is that? Is that humidity? What what is what is uh, going on there? Yeah, it is humidity. Um, it, sometimes it's also like twenty degrees during the day, and then the night time it'll it'll just have like like a little bit of water on the field. And as soon as the ball touches it, obviously being a leather ball, <laughs> it just like it's like a bar of soap. It really? Yeah, yeah, that bar of soap. That's yeah. I think it might have even been Scott Pendleby spoke about it like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. and that's why Gold Coast and Brisbane they're they're so dominant up there because they play in they train in those conditions a lot. Yeah, like we we go up there as um, Melbourneians or whatever and go and play and just think it's oh it's a beautiful day in Brisbane like it'll yeah. be really dry and, and then. They already know that it's going to be wet, so they they change their structure. They're they're a lot cleaner in those conditions, and That's a good point. Um, yeah, they're able to uh, uh, use that to their advantage, which they do. Yeah, definitely. Well said. Um, I reckon we're, I want to go into sort of the the now or the now or the recent now with with what you've gone through because I want to kind of um, break down your last sort of eight months, really. Because I mean, what you've navigated across the last eight months. Um, up until a few weeks ago, it was like a vicious cycle of just like up and down. Yeah. Like, I mean, to break it down, for obviously most people probably know, but you did um, your MCL leading into the grand final, which yeah. was absolutely heartbreaking. For those who haven't seen the Tay Adams episode, it's a great episode, which we'll, we'll obviously go through with Dan today of just going, what that's like for a person and player to miss it that's been involved the whole way through. And then obviously you get yourself back in preseason the, uh, the ACL, yeah. which is like – Life-changing injury in some regards. Yeah. Um, yeah. I honestly don't even know where to start with it, but just going, like, maybe we'll start with the MCL. I mean, yep. last season was just one of the special, like, one of the most special seasons probably of you'll always look back on in your career is what a group and just constantly winning footy and everyone's on the bandwagon of Collingwood, which never happens. Yeah. That must have been pretty cool to be a part of. Yeah, there's one moment I remember, like, um, you know, it was probably – Towards the end of the season, and we we're, we're like, there's a group of us sitting in the spa, and um, Scott Penderbury kind of uh, was talking about the 2010 flag, and we were sitting top of the ladder, and you know, we were kind of talking about, oh, you know, what if, what if, like, what if we win it, what if we win it, and he's like, boys, like, there's winning a there's winning a premiership for like a, a footy team, and you know, the average footy team, and then there's winning a premiership for Collingwood, and he's like, I just really hope you guys get to experience winning a flag for Collingwood because, like, it, it's almost like a it's bigger. It's like, it's, it almost feels like the whole of Melbourne is just like, it just feels, he said, it just feels different. You've always got it on your head. Like wherever you walk, people are, yeah, you on the flag. Like, yeah. Yeah. I've so. seen it with some of the 2010 players. Like yeah. they're still like as glorified as they were back then. Yeah. So you know that know? was like, I remember, I just distinctly remember that like, oh, wow. Like it, it must really mean, it almost feels like it almost means more when yeah. you're for Collingwood. So, um, yeah, unfortunately I wasn't a part of that, but, um, <clears throat> Yeah, it was it was still a cracking week to be a part of, and um, you know I got so close with Brisbane twice to to make into a grand final. So just to to be a part of that whole week and the build up and everything was pretty special. You're a big finals player. I mean, you've played a lot of finals now, yeah. so you've probably, you've experienced yeah. to the pointy end. So yeah. we can we can clarify that because you you are a superstar. I actually really I, I love watching you play, and I knew when you were coming to the Pies. I think a lot of Collingwood people felt this like your type of player was so needed. So. It was a, it was such a big boost to. Uh, I am an adopted fan, so let's be real, guys. Come on. Yeah. St Kilda was my heart, but Collingwood's the team I watch every week. Yeah, I caught the, I caught the fair bit of flack early days. Did you um, from yeah. Pies or Brisbane or both? Um, <laughs> probably a bit of both. Yeah. Probably just footy fans. In you general. can't win. No, in those can't. situations, yeah. like people don't see the business side. People don't see the personal, the professional side. No, like, they just see. They just the contract, see the yeah, amount of years, Brisbane, this, Collingwood. Like, yeah. The, like dog left him, you yeah, know, yeah, that yeah. type of stuff. It's a yeah. bit unfair. It is. Yeah. It can be like we're in this industry for such a short amount of time. And, um, I always, I always wanted to be a, a one club player. I always, um, that was always like my mentality, um, signing all the way through for nine years. And then at one point I was just like, I think, I think I need change. Like, and it just happened, you know, within six months and, um, my priorities changed. I felt like I wanted to be closer to family. My sister was having a kid. Um, Kelly, my partner, we discussed about what life would look like in a in a different city, and it was always going to be Brisbane or Melbourne. It wasn't going to be 
Adelaide or WA or Sydney. Yeah. It was always just going to be either we stay in Brisbane or some, and I finished my career there. She still had her family there. Yeah. Um, or we get back to Melbourne. She's had all of her extended family in in Melbourne. So, so it's a kind of a win-win either way from like a family point of view, which yeah. is ultimately, that's the factor that I think is unfair. It's like people don't understand those discussions that you're having with your partner and family, yeah. which almost does dictate the decision. Yeah, it like I, it can, it honestly, people may think like money obviously does come into it, but I'd say that almost trumps the money. Yeah. Cause you're like, you've got to keep your 50% of your household happy and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that must've been, that must've been a, like a, Challenging, but also an exciting thing as well. It's like the prospect of either starting a new life or, you know, locking in and, and building on what you've already started, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I just felt like, I felt like I'd, um, I, I wanted to trial a new training program and I, I felt like I was, um, I felt like I was, an, I was a good player in Brisbane, but I didn't feel like I'd reached my potential. And mm-hmm. if I haven't reached in nine years at one club, like maybe, maybe change is a good thing and maybe, yeah. maybe I could be, I could reinvent myself down in Melbourne and yeah. um, I feel like I've like barring all the injuries and what I've been through and whatever, I still do not regret the decision. I yeah, love, I've, I wouldn't either. No, I've, I found like I've, um, I've like, I've earned the respect of my, like of the players and the, um, and the staff and everything. And I feel like I'm a Collingwood person for life now. Yeah. But it's, it's a special club. But I, yeah. like I speak about all the time, the family aspect around it, um, which was really special and it was probably heightened. Obviously, when you're winning, everything's great, but it was heightened around the access they gave the family and friends around the grand final time, which yeah. sort of showed the club. And that's where, obviously, I sort of first met you and I'd, I'd learned, obviously, more about the injury and what you did. How did you actually do the MCL in the – Yeah. What, it was, was it Was it innocuous? Was it something – Yeah, that, it was pretty innocuous. So um, I basically, like, come and pressed in on bloke um, in the, our forward pocket. I think it was a minute left of the third quarter or two minutes left. Um, and I basically jumped up to, um, to spoil a handball, um, or to smother a handball. And as I've landed, um, uh, the guy got pushed into my leg and my foot just got trapped under and I just kind of, it, it, and it, watching it back now, I'm like, geez, it, it wasn't much in it. Like it didn't look like it, it just obviously jagged a little bit of the MCL. I, I think I did a great two tear. So it's a decent job, but, um, when you watch it, you're not like, oh, geez, like knees gone way out mm-hmm. or anything. It was just one of those things that obviously just hit, got me in the right spot and yeah. at the right time. And I ran downstairs um, with the uh, physio, and I was obviously pretty shattered. Like I kind of, I felt my knee was pretty unstable. Mm. They they gave me a little bit of confidence that oh maybe we might be alright. Tape it up or something. Tape right? it, I, they stra- strapped yeah. it right up. I couldn't feel my toes. While it's warm, I've done immediate. While it's warm, you can kind of get around. It's when it cools down. Yeah. The, but the deceiving thing is you can you can walk. Yeah. You just there's no flexibility. In yeah, it. I know. And yeah. I, I just felt like my. I honestly felt like my my foot was just like <laughs> hanging off. <laughs> it was the weirdest feeling. <laughs> yeah. I've done one before, but it's the same sort of thing. Like I've, I've tackled a bloke and I've dragged him over my knee. And so it's similar, both non, uh, both contact. Mm. Um, and then because of that, um, once once that all kind of happened and I, I realized that I wasn't going to play in the grand final, I, I kind of accepted it. And I, 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 had, um, I had Europe plan with Cal and we were going to um, – I had three weeks to get out of the brace to, so I didn't take the brace with me to Europe. So <laughs> that's a little it, that's a mini win. <laughs> yeah. So as, as much as like missing out on the grand final was like devastating, whatever. I kind of set myself new goals. I'm like, well, I can't play in the granny. Like, let's just get in the gym and just try and get my knee strong enough so I can get out of the brace, so I can go to Europe and just relax. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's this is probably what I want to get into as well because one, that's a crazy ass mindset because I probably relate to Tay Adams more where it was like, fuck. Yeah. Like probably Tay had the history of being there for so long and being the leadership group and all that sort of stuff. But even so, I mean, you've experienced that on the other side with Brisbane. Yeah. But um, that mentality is like pretty impressive to me because I think when you look at your both your injuries and I don't want to always talk about them, but I'm so impressed by how quick you've come back yeah. that you must be your regime of what you set up, like you must have done it perfect or even above perfect to – because they're both pretty big injuries to pretty big joints of your body and the way you play and you've come back and you've looked like nothing's changed. Yeah. Which means you've fuck, you've done the dog work. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, I've, I've been around footy a long time now and I, I've i seen a lot of guys come back from long-term injuries. And one thing I always like, I 
I, I hate when someone comes back and they're <laughs> either not not at the not at the level they were when they left, or they're mm. um, or they're like just way worse. Yeah. Um, I've always kind of had the mindset. I'm like, well, if I've got this time and I can't play footy, I want to get better at something. I want to be better at something. So when I return, I'm a better player or a better yeah. person. So that was that's always been my mindset. Um, and so that was my mindset was going and like getting back to just getting out of the brace really quickly, enjoying my holiday and then getting back to work. Mm. And I just, I probably found because it was off season, it was almost the worst time of year for an injury because you've kind of got no support around you in terms of like physios or um, training programs. It's, you know, it's when you get sent off on your off season, it's all very generic. Yeah. So I probably didn't, I look back now and I'm like, did I do enough work to, to strengthen my knee wholeheartedly? And if I did, I probably only did my right side and I probably didn't put enough effort into my left side. Oh, which day two That's of, an athlete mindset though. Yeah. Day two of preseason, yeah. Day two of preseason, ACL. Just, yeah, uh, crazy. And I, I always like, I know you shouldn't, but I always look back and I'm like, oh, is there something I could have done or is there, is there, did I not do something well enough to give myself the best chance of being bulletproof? Yeah. That's always the way I kind of look at it. And um, yeah, unfortunately, the ACL happened, and I remember the day it happened. I, um, I got the the call from the doc, and he was like, "Look, mate, yeah, um, scans just come through. You've done your ACL. Um, what do you want to do? You can either have two weeks off and just like go into the. Um, I think it, it was like the first of December. He's like, you can either just have two weeks off, maybe mid mid December, you get surgery, um, and then we'll like adjust from there and see like where we're at." Or you can, we can go and see the surgeon today. I'll I'll come in with you, and we'll go and catch up with him, and, and go from there. And I'm like, I'm not waiting. I might as well just like, I might as well, that's like, that's like, it's like yeah, it's attack rehab or not? Well, it's like, what am I going to do for two weeks? Like, yeah. I might as well just go and get the surgery and like get started. Like, fuck yeah. Why? Like, I, I can't just like feel sorry for myself for for two weeks and then and then start my rehab. I'm like, well, yeah. I might as well just. Get it done, get like it it's 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 happened. Like I, I can't do anything about it now. Let's just get this shit started. So <laughs> I went and saw. Um, Imagine being the doc in the other yeah. line, thinking like, "Fuck, man, he's going to be in tears," yeah. and you're just there, like, "No, mate, just fucking book it into yeah, it." Yeah. <laughs> Two hours. Yeah, we'll yeah, be there. Let's get it going, brother. Yeah. I walked home and Cal is like just bawling her eyes out, and I'm just like, "We'll be right." Like, like I'm tough. Like, I, like it's only it's only a knee. Like, it's not. I'm not. I'm not dying. I'm not yeah. like you know. I, I'm trying to like stay positive and trying to be this like. Uh, I almost feel like I had to be the rock. Like whenever I was around, me, he's like, <laughs> "That's <crying>. unbelievable!" <laughs> uh, shout out, Carl. There you go. Uh, yeah, that's so brilliant. I'm like trying to like. Keep did her. you know when it happened that it was like? Have you had you done one before? No, I never so done you one. did you? You oh, didn't yeah. know the, f- but you knew, right? Uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Can can you any form of just like can you just walk us through day yeah, two yeah. of what happened? Because so I picked up the ball. Um, I've got a guy on my back, and I've like gone to step and like ev- evade him almost. And I just, as soon as I did the mechanism, I just like, I remember my knee just clapped, heard a massive pop and I just laid on the ground and I'm just like, I just remember being like, ah. oh. I'm like, I think I've just done my ACL. I, I remember saying it. Like, I'm you've like, never done it before. You've nah, just got, you just, called it. Well, you just, like, you, I just, I, it was almost like a, um, I was like hovering above my body and I'd seen what I'd just done, like the mechanism and everything. I've seen, I've seen a few, fair few blokes in my team, like mm. in Brisbane and stuff doing before. And I knew as soon as I'd done that, the the way I moved and you hear the pop. And um, I had that like rush of pain initial and then it just disappears. And it was like all the all the things were like, yep, check, check, check. Yep, that's, yeah. uh, that's an ACL. Wow. So it was pretty devastating. Like I remember I remember just being like, fuck, I just can't get – I can't get to break. Like, yeah. I remember feeling that for you too because it was like – you played really well as well up until the MCL. Like for yeah. every chance you had, you played yeah. really good footy. And it's like you kind of – I don't know if you felt it as much as it looked, but the way you slotted in from like day one, like yeah. you'd kind of been there before with them in a, in a sense. I don't know if you felt that way. No, I definitely didn't. I've, I really I, I really struggled early days. Like I felt like I struggled as well. Like I, th- I think it was just the occasion of playing for Collingwood. and It's big, know, my, isn't it? My like, first game was um, Geelong uh, round one and, man, I reckon I – I barely touched the ball. I reckon I maybe kicked one goal and I just, I felt like the occasion just got the better of me and I was like, what have I, like, I don't want this to be my career. Yeah. Um, 
And then I started to play a little bit better. Then I had a finger injury. Then I come back from that. And then I, that's when I felt like I started to really slot in and understand how they want to play. And yeah. um, they wanted to play fast and through the corridor. And um, and the way our forwards play, we don't get a lot of touches, mm. but we're efficient when we go inside 50 and we put a lot of pressure on. And um, it's not like at Brisbane, it was kind of like you could lead up and, and get a lot of like um, – not, yeah. Like you can almost be outlets and and get a lot of um, easy marks and yeah. whatever. Whereas at Collingwood, it's more like we want you to be f- efficient or effective inside fifty and um, set up goals. And you know we'll, we'll kick when we go inside, we'll kick goals, but we don't need you up the field. Yeah, just impact the scoreboard and impact yeah, pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like yeah, it's just a different way that we we play. So did that take some time get adjusting to? Because that that's a oh, I mean yeah. that's a, a three and one eighty. I, I mean, always used to. Like hit up to the wings and try and get the ball. For like five, and, six years probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, even longer. Like that's kind of how we'd always played in Brizzy and then to play a completely different way and almost you're always running away from the ball. It was kind of, um, yeah, it took a little bit to get used to. And and guys do um, like take time to to learn that. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of like, oh, you played a certain way in Brizzy. Like, oh, you, you should be able to just <laughs> slot in and, and, and everything should be fine. Yeah, it's like well, it takes a bit of time. Like, and you got to learn how guys play. Like, obviously, Nick, you can you, if you've got half a meter, he'll hit you from anywhere on the That's field. Crazy. But um, other I'm guys, I'm not going to give Nick any more credit for his <laughs> kicking ability on this podcast because I feel like we've done it every second week. And yeah. it's just him and Josh. I just don't miss fucking no, targets, man. No. Yeah, we're pretty lucky. We yeah. got we got some phenomenal. Even like Jordy, like Jordy is a phenomenal kid. He's field kicking. I told yeah. him this, man. I I don't like. I've watched. Obviously, I got friends with Jordy when he was more playing like. He was kind of at that age where they'd flex him forward more. Yeah. Like he'd leading goal kicker on you and they almost won the flag. Yeah, yeah. And then he started playing midfield. I was like, bro, when did you be able to kick like 40 <laughs> metres like just like like a laser? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good kicks in your team. But for styles, like the fly style was, was a relatively – I mean, it's kind of what Richmond – people would say Richmond did. But I feel like from a playing point of view, you guys were so fit. Uh, the ball was moving so quick. It was like sometimes you feel like when you have the ball, you make, maybe rest a little bit. and yep. But it's like you guys are moving just as quick on and off the ball. Yeah. So yeah, I don't absolutely. know if it was a new, newish style, but for you, I mean, that's a whole change of world. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're definitely playing a bit, bit slower now. We've um, we've changed a little bit. We're, um, we're obviously leaking a lot of scores, you know, through the middle part of the year. So mm. we've tried to like shore up our defences and um, – not play as quick because obviously the faster you play, if you get turned over, it's a lot easier to score score against. You opening up the field a lot more, and so that was happening. Man, when you when you win a flag, like teams study the shit out of you. They're wow. trying they're trying to change the way they play so that they can combat you because you're the you're the blueprint. Yeah. So we've, and that's why it's probably so hard to back it up. Like you saw Geelong after twenty twenty two, like they they struggled mm. twenty twenty three. Now they're they're back up there. So. It's just a, um, it's something that like our team has to go through and um, yeah, I reckon we'll be better for it. I still feel like you guys are in this like window. Like I really do. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I think, I think a lot of people feel that too. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Which is better. Just to go back to the ACL, like what's yeah. so, what was the process? Um, like you do your surgery. Do they tell you like it's seven, eight months like of, of this or six months of this? No, they, they, or is it like a gradual like, hey, you've got a four-week block, we're going to hit this, then we're going to move into that? Like how, does that, how do they structure that? Yeah, so once I had surgery, that was a really tough time because it was just before we went on Christmas break. So you get three weeks off over Christmas. So I, you're not allowed to sweat for post-surgery for like 10 days. Um, it's all the cuts. Yeah, yeah, the, you know, risk of infection and all these sorts of things. So pretty much from 4th of December, which is when I had surgery, till the 17th-ish is when um, I was able to, like, kind of come back into the club and be a part. But the boys were on camp from the 17th, so it was like we basically had half a day with them. So, oh, no. And then after camp, they went straight to break. So I was pretty much for five weeks like by myself, um, trying to navigate how to rehab a knee with with pushing it far enough where I'm trying to achieve something, but not doing anything. Do you stupid. struggle with? I you already strike me as a guy that will probably is probably not good on an ACL rehab because you're going to push a limit. Yeah, uh, I, can you, do you can you do that with ACLs or is it very like, mate? Don't do more than eight reps. Um, like, it's probably not the reps and stuff. It's more just like the movement and um, obviously it's a pretty fresh. Um, like ligament that they've attached and there's a lot of swelling and whatever. So anything you do 
Mm. Like the the further you push it, the more swelling that might happen right. and, and these sorts of things. So you, you've got to it's a it's a very fine line, and I was trying to find that line. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I squatted it three weeks post surgery. <laughs> yeah, like you know, just a bar, like just learning how to how to squat again. Is that is that normal at that point? That doesn't feel normal. I don't know. Uh, well, again, like uh, my my ACL, I just did ACL. Yes. So a lot of guys, when they do an ACL, they'll do a meniscus as well, or they'll do an MCL, or right. they'll do something else, whereas mine was just clean cut, ACL, nothing else, no other damage. So my surgeon was like, you're, uh, if you're going to do one, which obviously you don't want to do scenario. it, yeah, it's the best case. So I think that's also why I was able to get back so quick, because right. if you think about it, if you've got an ACL that's injured and then you've got an MCL that's injured, well, your MCL might be healing great, but your ACL might take a bit longer, or your ACL might be healing great, but your MCL might be taking a bit longer. So you kind of got to wait for everything to be healing at the same point and right. it's a lot more but like- You could have come on here and just said, mate, it was a heroic comeback. Man. Nah, like, fuck, yeah. man, I, 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 I've, I've broken the mould. Oh, <laughs> I, I worked incredibly hard. Like, I, barely, I, I feel like you did though. Yeah, yeah, I did. Did you feel quite like, like it's a quite a lonely period. You kind of just touched on it, but just to dig into that, like yeah, it, it is, isn't it? It's like you've, you're almost, the mental rehab is as much as the physical too because when you go home, like- even though you might be sitting on the couch, it's like of ice or like yeah. elevate or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just never really switch off. I know. And um, one of my teammates up in Brizzy, he did an ACL and um, I remember he couldn't get his legs straight. Like the, the thing about ACLs is you, you, you've got to get your legs straight as early as possible. That's It's this really? thing. Yeah, it's, I didn't know about this, but I remember um, one of my teammates and he, um, he wasn't able to get it as straight as possible. So then once it had all healed, he yeah. like he still couldn't get his knee completely straight. So yeah. That like I remember, I remember that in the back of my mind. So I, as soon as I'd done it, I was like, "Get this knee straight, get this mm-hmm. knee straight." So I was doing everything I could to make sure that my knee was as straight as possible, and I was walking and and all these sorts of things. And it, it, it's something that I, um, you probably wouldn't even know like would happen as an AC, with an ACL. Yeah, didn't even think of that. Yeah, so um, I, I, that's why I wanted to make sure I rehabbed it right, especially early on because. Those those can affect you later on. Foundations, yeah. But yeah. speaking of your old mob, Brisbane, they I think they've had like five yeah. ACLs this year or something. It's a, yep. I mean, you can't plan for it, but no, geez, no. It's, a, it's, it's a strange because yeah, like, I don't know if if it's just like is it? It just feels like bad luck. Yeah, like I know they may say there's a bit of science to it, but I defy it, man. I just think like how many times would you have done certain movements? Yeah, uh, in ten years and just once, you know, know. it's just it's just yeah. Tough. Yeah. Oh, and as, like after doing one, I like I'd watch footy and every single time, so, like a marking contest, I'm like, oh, how did Wits. he land? Or oh, how did he not? How did he not get injured? Like, it's, <laughs> no, that's, that's like crazy. it's just like embedded yeah. in your mind that yeah. like. Yeah. How did you go watching footy post those sort of two injuries? Like, was that have you always been a guy that watches a lot of like footy on the weekend? It's like because you've always uh, done that, or you, yeah, you like that as yeah, well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't really like watching footy. Um, it's obviously really hard to watch your team play as well because when you're not playing, when you're not playing, like and they're winning, I defy anyone that like. Don't well, get me wrong, you'd rather them win, but it's tough. Yeah, just because even when they're losing, it's like, oh man, I'd love to be out there and help. And especially those periods of time for, during the year where we just didn't have a key forward, like mm. Checkers was injured, Coxie was out, um, DC was holding up the fort. <laughs> like yeah. we had like our young guys kind of sporadically going in there and um, asking a lot of of these guys and. I just like that was really tough because you, all you want to do is just be able to help them, and then it'd come Monday and they're like, oh man, like we miss you, like yeah. geez, like we love, like hopeless, we need someone like that, just to, like crash and packs, bring the ball to the ground, you know, just getting out marked, and that makes you feel even worse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was like part of the reason, like you're just trying to do everything and anything and everything to get back and um, help the guys, and you know, when when I was trying to make the push, like we were still a chance for finals and we're still, we're still like a chance for top four and whatever. So I was like, I was pushing, I was trying mm. to do everything I could just to potentially get back and um, uh, kind of be, be in that grand final push. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, just going into the the mind aspect of it all, I mean, what are the steps? You, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, obviously it's a different position now, but it sounds like you had a pretty strong, strong head through that process, which I find fascinating because I thought like, the wheels might sometimes fall, even though they'll always come back on, sometimes they tend to fall off for a little bit, especially yeah. back-to-back, missing grand final. But what what were sort of some things that either you were doing to distract yourself or just to even build up, you know, the resilience around what you had in front of you? Um, I love the gym. I absolutely love the gym. I love feeling strong and feeling, um, like, powerful. And so especially early on while I couldn't do a lot of leg weights, 
I put like a goal to try and hit um, 150 on the bench. Oh, that's cool. So it was just like a little goal that it was good for me, like mentally and like, you know, if I could hold a little bit of that strength, uh, like when I come back to footy, then that'd be a good thing as well. So mm. I got like, I put on probably like five or six kilos just sort of like pure mass <laughs> during that period. And it's the max. Yeah, because I wasn't running and, and whatever. So um, I didn't end up hitting the, the the bench press goal, but that was really good because it was, I, I was able to just get in the gym and do what I loved and um, I could do my leg weights as well, but then know that I, I still had my upper body to do and it kind of just fed a bit of that like competitive um, side of me. So I think I ended up getting a 145 and I, I tore my pec. <laughs> <laughs> I, my that week. Yeah, I, did, it, I didn't like I didn't like ping it or anything but I was just doing, yeah, I, was doing stupid, I was doing stupid amount of reps and whatever yeah um and then I um that week I I remember I put 60 kilos on the bar and I tried to do it and I was like man like I'm so sore like something's wrong yeah, yeah and then I tried to like two or three days later I tried to do it again and I was like, nah, I'm done. <laughs> like, oh, so then I didn't bench for about six weeks. So who were the who were the guys in the gym at Collingwood? Even in your experience at Brisbane, like, because uh, sometimes uh, I mean, lifting weights and the strength work. Like, who were the guys that stood out to you in that space? Yeah, um, Brizzy days were Steph Martin. He was a monster. Oh, yeah. He just looks like it. Yeah, yeah as well. He he, had, he didn't have like huge legs or anything, yeah. but man, he could. He, he I reckon one day he was. Well, we're not talking super deep, but like. I reckon he had 300 kilos or over on the bar, like doing back squat. Um, yeah, crazy. When you look at his legs, you're like, man, this. It, there's no way. But he just couldn't put on mass on his calves Jesus and stuff. He's just one of those Christ. guys. But super strong, super powerful guy, um, really good fella as well. And then Marcus Adams, he was another, obviously, like you, you look at him. I think his nickname was Spess. So <laughs> oh, really? Yes, yeah, specimen. specimen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he, um, I think he, he told me his bench press record was like, 180 maybe or something but yeah I remember he used to go into the gym put on 140 on the bench just do reps and then just like walk out <laughs> <laughs> that's unbelievable um, yeah so there were a couple of guys we don't have like I feel like the game's changed a lot as well like we probably don't really have those sort of guys that are just hulking yeah because um, you've got to be able to run these days well is it do you feel like um, I've I said this with soccer like particularly when you watch the Premier League it's almost like you got to be an athlete first like yeah. you can have all the tricks and skills but if you can't run Yep. You know, high volume for long periods of time. It's it's almost like you probably can't make it anymore. No. In that, is that is that similar with AFL, do you feel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, back to my like, ACL rehab, that's kind of like – that was my um, my coach's philosophy. He's like, we want to we teach you to become a better athlete and mm. um, teach you to run better, more mechanically sound, so that when you do get back, like you'll actually be a more efficient runner and – um, I was able to hit a couple of PBs along the way and like sprint PBs and stuff um, early on in my rehab, which I feel like was a massive mm -hmm. help to how I was able to help my let knee function and um, yeah, get back as fast as I did. Hey guys, just a quick pause in this episode to compliment our partners of the show. You guys know that I've been sponsored and supported by Dabble, the gambling agency for a while now. This place has a special place in my heart because it is like the social network of gambling. You can follow superstars of the game, copy their bets. You might not know so much about a certain sport, but you can copy someone who does and increase your chances of winning some money. Um, obviously, if you're not a gambler, please only bet what you can and are willing to lose. Please dabble safely, gamble responsibly, as we always say. Just so you guys know, this year I've been taking over the streaming space at Dabble every Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Jake's Take is live. It is the wild, wild west of streaming. There's not too many sporting agencies or gambling agencies out there doing what we do. We put on a few bets throughout the show. We get some guests on. We have a lot of fun. It's all within the Dabble app. If you guys want to jump on board, the link is in the bio. Let's get back into the episode. Is it true you, you made your debut? Was that around John O'Brown's uh, farewell for yeah, Brisbane. Yeah. Was that even in his last game? Or was it, Was it? Uh, I think it was around his last season, right? Yeah. So I debuted around 15, 2014. His last game was the round 13. Right. Um, oh, so you just missed it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, John O'Brown, he's a, he was a weapon. I remember training on him uh, at, at training, one of my first sessions, and um, I've kind of like just – put my arm on his back and we're like doing like a little bit of match play and he just he just went crack and just got me across the back of the jaw and he's like don't you fucking touch me <laughs> <laughs> no he didn't <laughs> and I was just like I was like oh, oh my okay. god he's like I was like oh okay like 
Oh, he's the boss. Or um, yeah, or just like to be fair, what's that? Twenty fourteen. That's yeah. eleven years after he's won his third flag as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So he's got a young. He's just yeah. He's yeah, strutting, bro. Yeah, absolute puff as well. I was like, oh <laughs> yeah. man, don't touch the king. Yeah. Um, but he was incredible. I learned a lot from him. Um, he was a great man. Can uh, you can you share what what are like some of the things that you st- stood out to you just about him? Because even though he's a bit older, like he was still. Yeah. It was kind of like everywhere he went, it was like he's the oh, guy. Just had that aura about yeah, him. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, just the way he held himself, um, the presence which he took on field, um, his aggression on field as well was something that I like. I learned pretty quick that if you're not um, at, at junior footy, I've always kind of said this with like young key key defenders or key forwards or whatever, um, the ball kind of gets kicked up and usually like a whole pack will come and everyone will just kind of jump at the same ball and mm. um, and the best person will usually mark it. Whereas when you get to AFL level. If you just try and run and read the ball and try and jump at the ball, your defender is just going to nudge you under the ball and mark it every time. Like you need a, there's so much craft that goes into that. I learned a lot from him in that yeah. sense and how aggressive you've got to be. And you've you got to be the one to instigate the um, the contact and own your space. And um, that'll allow you to have best um, like yeah. best attempt at the, attempt at the ball. Um, I've seen so many guys come through that have had a lot of talent or whatever, but didn't have that aggressive side or didn't want to, um, you know, put body on or whatever, and they kind of find themselves out of career just purely because they're they're not, um, yeah, willing to to do that. And that's what yeah. guys from yesteryear were so good at. That that was what they built their game around was yeah. how how to how to use that craft to their advantage. Wow, that's cool. Uh, you've uh, also what I wanted to get to is you've spoke you've played with like some superstars in in your career and particularly like Lockie Neal's one that stands out. Charlie Cameron, I'd love to just pick your brain. Uh, start with Lockie Neal, like. You might even people saying he might get his third brown though, which is yeah. just cr- crazy. But um, I I've always loved watching him. He seems like he's a guy that I don't know how he's managed at this point. Where like it seems like his temperament's so good with people just trying to like ruin his day yeah. every time he plays. Like it's got to that point with him, which tagging's kind of I don't know if it's as profound as it was when you first came in the AFL, for example. Yeah. But yeah, what was it like strutting around with him, particularly those those days where Brisbane was starting to get, you know, towards the end of the final series and stuff? Yeah, I feel like um when we when we got lucky, I feel like when he was at Frio, they everyone kind of just knew him as like this accumulator. Like he just oh yeah, he just kinda he'd get ball, like, but it wasn't really that damaging or whatever. Man, people couldn't be more wrong. Like when he got to Brisbane, we, like his ability to just find the footy, but then also set guys up and like just we were just um, – we become such a better team when he when he come to us and I feel like he become a better player when he come to us as well. He, his ability to, like, kick the ball, we, I reckon he's underrated. Like, mm. he's – like, he, he can spin out of the – out of pressure and then just find a dinky little kick and set someone else up and he was probably the cleanest player I've ever played with. Probably the cl- – well, he, he would be the cleanest player in the league. Like, he just doesn't fumble um, his handballing abilities. When you said that – Footy's like a bar of soap sometimes at the Gabba. makes that oh, even more he's, impressive. He's playing a different game. Yeah. <laughs> no one's no one's playing the same game as Lockie up at the Gabba. Like, yeah. He, um, yeah, he just doesn't fumble. Some of the one-handed like pickups and takes and um, his ability to read off um, off packs and Ruckman and yeah, he's just incredible. And he's he's become since or, since we come to Brisbane, I, I reckon he um, he's become a better finisher as well. Like he's kicking more goals and um, these sorts of things, which I don't know if. He probably had as as much of his Frio days. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's a he's a bona fide superstar, and will go down as a legend of the game. Yeah. It's, it's a privilege to have played with him, and um, he's a really good guy. So. Yeah, awesome. Char- what about Charlie Cameron? Because yeah. I I love watching him play. I feel like sometimes he plays against when he plays against Collingwood, he he, he tends to kick a lot of goals as yeah. well. Um, but just uh, he's just a player that can turn a game uh, on its head pretty really quickly. His, his speed, I don't know. If on TV it does it justice to maybe what you've seen in person, but he just seems light and quick. Like having having a player like that, you've probably got elements of it with Bobby Hill and Jamie Elliott and so forth, and and Ginny when he was at the at the Pies. But Cameron was almost like the elite forward pocket or the elite sort of small forward, if you will, in the in the competition, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Charlie's one of my best mates. I still, um, yeah, still catch up with him when I can, and um, he he was incredible. His ability to um, He's got like obviously bona fide speed. Like mm. kick the ball out the back, you know that there's no one in the comp that can go with him when uh, when he's running back to goal. Uh, but his craft is like a as like a mid mid to small forward winning one on ones. Was 
incredible. Like yeah. you just you can kick it in his direction. And, um, he will he will either get a free from someone holding him, or he will he'll spin the bloke out of the way and just mark the ball. Yeah, um, yeah, he's such a talent. Um, one of uh, one of the funniest blokes at the footy club as well. Just ball, really, just a ball of energy. Like, oh, th- you need yeah. them, man. Don't uh, you? I don't know how much gym that bloke does, but like, <laughs> he's, really? he's dancing around the gym and carrying on. <laughs> yeah. and, um, got his shirt off, swinging it around. Like, he's just that sort of guy. Like, um, he's so good. Um, Makes going to work fun when, oh, they're, when yeah. they're in the team, like yeah, those yeah. type of characters yeah. for sure. And he he sets the Gabba up like his playground as well. Like <laughs> yeah. he, he absolutely owns the Gabba. Um, What's the go with the song after goals up there? Is that like a thing that came in when you were there or yeah, is that? I don't even know when that came in, like maybe three, four years. Is, three, that, four is years that happening? Is that a trend around the game? I know Giants maybe have it. Um, I've yeah, I definitely think... noticed it at Brisbane. Well, I heard it on the weekend. We played, um, we played Sydney and Errol Goulden kicked that that snap late in the game and yeah. the whole the whole SCG was singing Oh Errol <laughs> oh my yeah. god it was like absolutely going Turning nuts into Man, I, I couldn't, I, it was so loud I was like <laughs> I was like, we're going to struggle to win this. I reckon after the song play, they were singing it for like three minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> the, yeah, well, I'm pretty sure the Gab, I don't know if it's, there's a, there's a song that like the, the whole crowd sings before the game, which I forget what it's called uh, now. Uh, Brayden, yeah. I don't know if you'll know what the name is, if you've, no, I can't. I can't think. Uh, anyway, but then I'm pretty sure there's like some individual. Oh yeah, everyone's yeah, got their song. Yeah, Joe, which Joe's got Frozen. I know that. <laughs> that's. I reckon yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I reckon that's awesome. I'd yeah. love to see that come down to some of the Melbourne teams. But yeah. I noticed that. Did was that something like the media, social media team came up with? Or was that? Yeah. The, yeah okay. They um they really just started to um do some really cool things up at Brizzy. Um, the media team started to get kind of like the Giants. Like they're a bit like mm. um out there. They're always on top of all the memes and. Um, things that are happening in, in the like social media world, and they're mm. kind of like the first ones to um, to play pranks on each other and whatever else. That's which, awesome. Yeah, which is good. It, it kind of enlightens the. It makes like uh, the like when you're versing other teams, it kind of brings the the fun of it. Yeah, yeah which is good because there's an element of fun that I always talk about. Like sport, AFL is the funnest sport you ever play. Then you get in the AFL, and it's like you, it loses an element of fun because there's so much. Um, so much height of expectation that you've yeah. got to deliver on and you kind of don't enjoy it unless you're hitting those expectations, yeah. which you're obviously accustomed to your whole sort of career. Yeah. Then you get to the AFL and you're like, oh, I'm not in the first 22 all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, just to want to go through those early days because I reckon you had a pretty really strong initiation and it was a, a tough period as well, yeah. like in regards to results from from the footy club yeah. point of view. So like, How did you – like for you initially, it's crazy when you look back how many finals you've played when you've – those early doors, you probably never thought you'd – Yeah, so – yeah, so – I think my first final series was in uh, 2017, and I've and my team's played finals every year since. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's like, awesome. That's a but, good start. My first, um, so 2014, 15, 16. I think we finished bottom once and second bottom twice. And um, I think you know we'd, we'd go to Adelaide Oval. I have I had nightmares of playing at Adelaide Oval. Mm. I think my average losing margin was like 80 or 90 points, and mm. um, it was just like a really tough. Like Adelaide were really strong during that period. Yeah, Port were really strong, and I reckon they just they saw us coming and they were like, "Oh, we're yeah. gonna absolutely Fresh kill these mate. guys." And um, so that was like you know you, you just any away game you're like, "Oh man, this is you know if you, unless if you played like a, I think Carlton weren't, weren't great at the time or whatever, it was just like wherever we'd go. We'd just hopefully try and keep it within like forty or fifty points. Like it was, it was really tough. <laughs> Damn. Um, I think one year, maybe twenty sixteen, our average losing margin, no, our average points against was one hundred and thirty one. Oh my god! Average. So oh you think god. about that. Like that's, that's how many that's, goals is that? That's, that's twenty goals. Like twenty t- goals. That's average. Hard. Yeah. So we um, we really struggled to defend, obviously. <laughs> that's probably why def- the, like the backline's so strong these days because yeah, it's been through a bit, been through a bit of shit. They had uh, had a lot of experience. <laughs> yeah, balls <laughs> down there a lot yeah. early days. What was the what was the catalyst of change um, with Brisbane? Was it just the timing of maturity of players, or what were the specific things you pointed out from like 2017 onwards where um, you when, guys were just so strong? When I got drafted, we had a big discrepancy of older guys we had a lot of 30 year olds and a lot of um 18 19 year olds yeah so there was, we didn't have anything in the middle so it's really hard like you've got all these old guys who are um you know at the at the end of their careers and they're trying probably more worried about what they're going to do after footy and then you've got all these young guys that don't really have any um pathway or any uh any support around them because yeah. it's as a, as a 30 
two-year-old, you don't want to be hanging out with an 18-year-old. You know, it was just like, <laughs> yeah. it was a different era. Yeah, like, kids first. Yeah, yeah. It's kind kids of like on you, you TikTok. Gotta your, yeah, you <laughs> got to earn your initiative back then. Um, and so I feel like that's why we struggled a lot. And then once we kind of moved those older guys on and uh, we brought in some really good young talent and then my age and and that were probably in that 22 to 24 range, then all of a sudden we had like a really good young crop of guys like – Hugh McCluggage and Rayner yeah. and Zach Bailey and um, Harris Andrews. Big names and, now, aren't man, they? All, all of them, all, really. All really good players and yeah. are, like they're the blueprint of, of why they're good. And then, they, and then they'd top them up with Lockie and um, Zorks was playing some really good footy at that stage. And, um, you know, now they've brought in like Dunkley and these guys. So they've kind of just topped up what was already a really good foundation. Yeah. I think that's why they're, they're such a good like, – They've got their powerhouse because they've got yeah. so much talent all over the field. I think they'll probably get another father son next year, aren't they? Ashcroft as well. Yeah. It's just like keep stocking it's and scary. stocking, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, Chris Fagan, he's I, I look. I know he played for Collingwood, but I just I kind of want him to get get a get a flag. Like he's he's just been like I know he's been around successful environments and so forth for you know a long time, and he's part of that Hawthorne clan that's just experienced so much. But I just feel like Brisbane. He's been there so many times. What's what makes him? The coach he is because he keeps getting him to that part of the season as well. As much as the squad's good, like obviously, yeah. there's a, there's an element of of connection with the coach too. Absolutely, he um, he was great. I loved um, I love Faze. Always um, got on with him really well. He was one of the most like just genuine um, coaches, and he was always looking at himself first as how he can get better to help us get better. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was what I I always really admired about him and. Um, he was really, always really vulnerable and, um, and he, he definitely tried to change our culture. And, um, I, re- I remember when we first kind of, when he first come in, he used to just kind of ask us like, what do we want to be known as? What do we want to, um, what do we want to achieve? What do we, how do we change what we are at the moment? Because at, at the time, we were bottom of the ladder mm. and all that. And he kind of like, we, we, that was when we kind of spoke about building the Gabba as a fortress and how do we do it and why. Um, why that's important to us to play, you know, 11, 12 games every year. We like, you know, if we, if we can win majority of them, yeah, you only need to win a few away that's games true. to play finals. That's so, a great point. Um, and it is such a, such a hard place to win. And now look at Gold Coast, they're doing the same. Like they, it's the same thing. I think it? they, did they win every game this I, year? I, the, I think so. What they, they probably more problem for them was they just struggled to get the away wins, but yeah, now they're yeah, starting but, to, but now they're starting to come. Yeah. yeah so which is scary. I know. So, yeah. I mean, you dread playing playing those teams up there like they're, yeah. they're really making it hard to, to they win played unbelievable against the pies up there yeah I was at that game did you play that game nah nah yeah you were yeah, yeah. they were they were incredible I, yeah. I thought that's a serious team yeah um, just to, on the probably with what you can share just to understand like a player point of view when like the AFL trade sort of period happens like and, and you have your sort of heart split in two places of what's the best thing for you career wise or you've got to, you know, discuss with your family. Like how does that work from a communicating with Brisbane and then like obviously assessing the options of like is that coming to your agent? Is are you having discussions, you know, with Brisbane as well to just kind of keep them in in the loop of what you're thinking? Like yeah. is that or is it is it a bit of a poker as well? Because yeah, it's, it's a bit of poker. Like you've it's so it's so different to a lot of other sports. You've got um you know, rugby where they kind of say that they're out the, a year Why or two before. Why do they do that? Well, they, they, know, the last of, season of their contract, they're going to play 25 games at yeah, home and they're like, oh, I'm going next year. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good it's, point. It's so like, they're so open about it and that's what they've become accustomed to. Whereas with us, it's all it's all secretive. It's all this, it's all it's that. It's media that, that makes a story before, yeah. yeah players and, never come out saying anything. And then it's also like, if you come out and then, and then the club's kind of got that against you to not play you or, you know, if your season's over, well, you just won't play. Or yeah. if you've got triggers in your contract for, you know, game incentives or whatever, you just won't hit them. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah. I feel like that's the, the worry. That aspect, or that's yeah. why the players probably worry and managers and what. And it's also just the way we've always kind of done it. It's like, I'm not going, I'm not going, I love it here, I'm not going. Yeah. Um, come to trade period, <laughs> I'm going, see. <laughs> yeah, well, it's brutal. It's a yeah, brutal. It is, yeah. what, how, so when Pies came calling, I guess, what were some of the conversations or the people you spoke to where you like, you just felt, that, that connection it felt it was the right place for you. Yeah. Um, every time I um, was up for contract, um, I always kind of said to my manager, oh, like, I just want to kind of go with Brisbane. So I never really put the feelers out. And then probably my second last contract, which would be my sixth year, um, 
I was like, oh, is anyone kind of interested? And he's like, he kind of always said to me, he's like, if you, I can put the feelers out, but if anyone, like people find out. Yeah. Like that's the Brisbane, right? Brisbane will find out that I've put the feelers out or whatever. Like everyone yeah. kind of talks. So he's like, you know, you'll, they might come and like give you a shit deal or whatever, or they might be unhappy or whatever that you've yeah. kind of put the feelers Sport. out. Yep. So I just kind of, every year I was kind of like, oh, well, just, just Brisbane. Like we'll just go with Brisbane. Like I love it here. Um, I see myself in Brisbane. I, I probably see myself in Brisbane post footy as well. Like I just, I love Brisbane. Like let's just stay. And then so when it come into my final year of my contract and I was um, an unrestricted free agent, um, I, I kind of was like, well, let's actually put the feelers out and see if there is actually anyone in there interested. And Brisbane come early um, wasn't really a deal that I was happy to sign. Um, and then one of the Adelaide come uh, Adelaide clubs come knocking and I was kind of like, oh, it's always going to be out of Brisbane and Melbourne. Like I don't really want to mm. – um, uh, I don't like I don't see myself in you didn't Adelaide have or, Sydney there, or yeah. WA. Like I was always yeah. just going to, going to be either Brisbane or yeah. um, or Melbourne. So You simplified the process for yourself in a yeah, way. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, and then, well, I don't, yeah, if, you know, if we have kids or anything, like I don't have the family support. Well, it's big, anywhere. that's why it's a bit, that's a life decision, yeah, but is, the yeah. point you did it, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so once, maybe like a month or so later, Collingwood come knocking and as soon as they kind of came, I never really thought my, thought of myself as leaving. Mm. And then when I sat down with my manager, he's like, mate, go to the biggest club in the land. Um, they're really keen to have you. Um, get to play on the MCG how many times Great a year yeah. and I'm just and you like your background family and, and oh, I was like wow this is actually something I should probably consider mm. and that was probably until I actually heard that Collingwood come, had come I probably had never even really pe- like vi- envisioned myself leaving Brisbane yeah. but at that, that point I was like oh wow how, this is actually this actually does sound pretty cool and then I didn't really I kind of was just like, oh, let's just put it away. I want to, um, I want to just focus on footy and just kind of try and play some better footy and and make sure that I, um, you know, earn earn whatever contract I get and, and try and play good enough footy where um, I feel like it's right. And yeah. I remember we were playing. It was round three. We were playing um, Geelong. I'm sitting in my room. I reckon I was doing some uni, and um, I get a call from Fags, and I'm like, <laughs> hey, like this is day of the game, and I'm like, hey mate, like what's up? And he's like. Um, he's like, hey, just like checking you're all good. Like, are you all right? And I'm like, I'm like yeah, well, what's up? And he's like, oh, have you have you not read anything? And I'm like, no, I'm just in my room just doing uni. What's up? And he's like, oh, there's just like a big spread of like you being um, saying that you want out and this and that and um, you're going to look for your future. And I was like, whoa. Oh, <laughs> like, man. I hadn't, even, I hadn't even spoken to anyone or anything about any like nothing. Did you go into damage spoken. control there because you actually done nothing wrong? Do you, do you feel you have to justify it to the – to fakes um, or does yeah, he, a little bit because you can't like yeah, yeah. it looks bad when you haven't yeah. really done anything bad <laughs> and then yeah from that point on it was just kind of like this like snowball of like oh. well he's not signing like and then um, you know it kind of come out that like Collingwood were interested and then it was just like the worst kept secret probably yeah. all year yeah and it's really hard like it is it's really hard to walk into the footy club every day like and everyone knowing that um, you know you're probably not going to be there and but no one wants to ask you and but Everyone kind of knows. And then, <laughs> that's cr- yeah, that's it, unbelievable. It's just like, yeah, it's kind of like this awkward. It almost feels like you're, um, yeah, you're like uh, cheating on them, cheating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it's like, what are you supposed to do? No, <laughs> you know exactly. what I mean? Like, like yeah, you're just trying to do what's best for you. And, and you played with and, those, like a lot of those guys for nine years at that point, or whatever, eight years at yeah. that point. And so. even up until like, like we played in a prelim that year, and I, I said um, all the way, I was like. Couldn't give a fuck what's happening next year. Like I'm all in on this year. Like I'm, I want to do anything and everything we can mm. to win a flag. Like that's that was that's my goal. Yeah. And then whatever happens after that, like yeah. we'll deal with that in the future. But which is the, all you can do, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that I hadn't checked out. That's like, great. I was I was 100 percent in. That's great. Yeah. Um, and we played in a prelim, and um, I think yeah, Geelong. Yeah, just Geelong ended up winning it. Yeah. Geelong were just way too good that year. Yeah. Um, and they deservedly so won the flag. So. Yeah, no, you're spot on. Actually, um, sorry, just on that. I remember, we, so we lost the, uh, I think we must have played the Friday night and then Collingwood and Sydney, Sydney were playing one the point, one it? point. And I remember being at the pub with all the Brisbane <laughs> boys. I'm like, oh, 
they can't win the flag. I can't go to a team that's just won the flag. Like, because I knew if Collingwood yeah. made, made the grand final, they were not losing to Geelong. I just felt like they well, had they, a, what, like, I, I felt the the grand final as such was the, the elimination, yeah. uh, not the knockout, uh, whatever, the first final. Yeah. Because I think Collingwood went, they went like six points or seven points. Yeah, they yeah. took Geelong all the way. They just, they just had this like steamroll of, emo- uh, of uh, momentum. Yeah. I just felt like if they made it, they like – they had won nine, uh, 10, 11 games in a row or something, and they I were just winning all these too. games by point. And um, so I'm sitting at the pub, and all the Brisbane boys are just like, oh, fuck, what a game, what a game. And I'm just like, oh, please, Sydney, please, Sydney, please, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were up by like 23 points or something at, um, with like a couple of minutes to go, and then it ended up just being a point. And I was like, yeah, I, I'd say it now, like jokingly, but like, yeah, it was just an incredible, um, it was an incredible run from Collingwood then. Yeah. And I was pretty, pretty stoked to. Um, yeah, to, to go to a team like that. Well, you kind of were, you've been, you've literally crossed over the two best teams in the comp in like the same year because obviously they ended up being the grand final. Yeah. So why, I'm, I'm interested to see because obviously Brisbane Lions got an elite um, environment and Collingwood's got an elite environment. So we both know that. But what, what was the difference like when you went to Collingwood? Anything that stood out to you around, you know, the way Collingwood do things, the way Fly interacts, the way he's set, like what were some of the things that probably were more noticeable of changes of, of things you either had to get used to or just naturally just impressed you? I feel like um, Collingwood had a really em- real emphasis on um, how they train and how they um, mm. like making sure that everything you do sets you up for training really well and playing really well. Whereas I felt like Brisbane, they, they had a really strong culture of like, um, they, they loved getting in the gym and they loved, um, running really hard. And they like running was like a big part of their, um, you know, like what, what three K time trial you do and like connection. Was yeah, yeah, like running was like, was a big part yeah. Of it. Yeah. Wow. We'd, we'd all, um, like in That's the off season, culture. yeah, in, in the off season, we'd all run together and whatever. When I got to Collingwood, it was like, no one really ran, but we all got our running in, um, in our drills and all that. It was Disguised just like running as I yeah, call it. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like, um, that was the focus. There's so many ways to skin a cat, as you know. Mm. Like, um, so, like Brisbane had this like yeah, real like high end focus on like their training in terms of um, like heavy weights and um, endurance running, whereas Collingwood was a lot more like short, sharp, um, change of direction tr- training, and um, probably a little bit more like emulates a game of footy, especially the way we wanted we wanted to play. We want to play live game, so we love chaos. We loved um, you know being able to uh, win the ball off turnover and then explode the other way yeah. um, and that so it's like a different recipe but same result yeah Isn't, that's yeah. interesting yeah it is and i'm sure different teams do it differently now and and they'll, they'll always do it differently but they're all similar yeah did uh, you touched on it but just to sort of round out with a couple of questions because we've got a couple fan questions guys so I appreciate you guys uh sending some of those in um but just yet yeah, you touched on it a little bit but i uh you start and just getting used to playing for collingwood which it's it's i think it's even heightened coming from your mouth um, that because you played so many finals for Brisbane. Brisbane's a big club and you guys were selling out the Gabba. But even for you to say when you came to Collingwood, like the occasion, the crowd, like, can you just give me the average Joe what that's like when you're walking out into the gladi- the modern day gladiator stadium of like, you know, sport? Yeah, well, I suppose like every every team that plays Collingwood, it's their biggest game for the year. Is it? Or did you see that as well? For, like when you play against Collingwood, is there, is there that aspect of like, because yeah, you know it's going to be a sellout? Yeah, like so. It's what you play we, for, uh, and it's always it's your schedule is usually pretty like set in stone because like Brisbane, you play Easter Thursday every year. Um, you know, you got Queen's Birthday, you've got Anzac Day. Um, you're always playing Carlton twice, mm-hmm. um, so you you're always playing Essendon twice as well. So, and then your away games, like you, you'll sell a game to Gold Coast or whatever, and that's their biggest game of the year. Yeah. You know, so every team you go, like every team you play, it's their. You know, they're selling it, it is, out. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the Gold Coast game was on land on school holidays as well. Yeah. So, so it's like it's they like strategy. It yeah, yeah, the strategy behind it. Oh, the is, AFL would set it up so that they can make the most money. Yeah. For sure. Like, it's funny. It was like round four, you're in a grand final. Like yeah. for the parade, like yeah. Anzac Day or whatever. Yeah, like it's yeah. just what the fuck? Know, it's yeah. it's insane. It's wild. So. <laughs> yeah. That's um it is good though, because then you, you can kind of set up your year knowing that you're playing these big games and mm. Um, you play a lot of Friday nights and so you get your weekends as well, which is, it, it doesn't sound like much, but it actually kind of, it reinvigorates you, you guys for like the season's so long. You, you look at Sydney, like they've been the best team all year. Yeah. And, and, you, and then they go through a flat patch because like 
it's just so hard to stay. Are you at not the surprised top. by that? Because obviously people have, have were so heavy on Sydney. You've experienced where you've had long runs in season where you've been undefeated and you've experienced blips and all that. Like from a from a player point of view, like particularly what we're seeing with the ladder, like Carlton and, and all these teams, it must be hard to maintain that level of performance. Oh, like, sure. how do you see it? Like, do you have more sympathy and understanding to oh, yeah. how that works? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you th- look at um like last year, everyone kind of gets the rose-coloured glasses on and looks at our season. Oh, you know, they won the flag and whatever. It's like we we got we got smashed by Hawthorne late late in the year last year. We lost a couple of other games like real late in the season. Um, we lost to Brisbane. And so we, we kind of like were crawling to finals mm. and then we were able to like turn that around come finals. But it, like just because you won the flag, like I feel like people forget that. They, yeah. forget, they just think that you – But oh, you last just, three games, wasn't it, before the finals? So I think, yeah, I think the, we lost. the wings got clipped as such. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So – I'm not surprised that that's happening to Sydney at the moment yeah. or Carlton are going through it. It's it's probably a little bit harder this year. It seems like the the, the whole rep, like the, the comp is a lot more rounded. And yeah. I mean, we're I think like thirteenth is still like a chance for finals, which is just wild. Yeah. And then if you lose a game out of and you're in the top four, you, you fall down to eighth. <laughs> it's so fun as a neutral yeah. just to watch like because yeah. you're yeah. Like teams are so written off that are in the top four. Yeah, <laughs> it's I know. like, what's going on? Yeah, you so. know. Um, hey, we've got a couple of fan questions before you ask. The, before we ask sort of the the round out unlaced question that we ask every guest. This one's from Jacob Merritt 04. Who was Dan's biggest role model growing up, and why? Um, well, probably was my dad. Non sport. Non sport. Yeah, well, probably my dad. Like, yeah. he. Um, yeah, so he's a tattoo artist by trade. Um, no way. Yeah, which is pretty cool. No, I don't have any tattoos. That no. is what is going on no, there, no, by yeah, the way. Yeah, no. yeah, so it was pretty cool. Like I grew up in like a tattoo um, household where um, he was an electrician by trade, but then always had the dream of becoming a tattoo artist. And at the age of 21, 22, he, um, he ended up going over to – um, Canada and America and traveling and learning from different guys because as he always says, didn't have fucking social media back then, you know, <laughs> we had to fucking work for it and yeah. whatever else. I, um, you know, everyone's got it so easy these days. It's just social media. You can yeah. find anything and everything uh, on there. So he actually had to go and travel and learn and um, find the best tattoo artists and um, and stay with them. And um, that was kind of where he did his apprenticeship. And then he become like a world-renowned tattoo artist in um, the Japanese kind of art. Mm. Um so it was pretty cool to watch uh, or learn more about him as, as I got older and um, the sacrifices he had to make. And um, they lived in Calgary in Canada for a wow. number of years. Um, yeah. Is so, that snow country? No, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. Yeah, so they used to go up to like Banff and stuff like to um, wow, that's unbelievable. go skiing. and Yeah. So it was pretty cool. Whistler, all that sort of stuff. So they um, they did that for a number of years before kids and then they wanted to start a family. So they come back to Australia and um, he's still got – Tattoo shop in uh, in Richmond for what's he's had it since maybe two thousand six maybe so wow. ten years yeah so Shout out, should we give it a plug what's it uh, called yeah dynamic tattoo you dynamic can. tattoo guys come on yeah. Collingwood fans if you're getting any Collingwood orientated tat that yeah. is got to be the place to go yeah so uh, um, Mr McStave we have to have to give him a shout out for yeah. that so he always kind of like instilled like hard work and um and like. He always used to kind of say, you know, I've watched guys that got a lot of talent and they they didn't work hard and mm. you know they um they weren't able to make it. Whereas like I probably didn't have the talent, but I, I worked super hard and I've able to set like you know the, that, our family a, up. Got that work. Just hearing you now, I feel like your work ethic. You can never, you'd never question it. It yeah. seems like it's been instilled in your upbringing. Yeah, well, I've, that's what I. Tr- I would hate to to leave the industry and yeah. not give myself. Like I'm I'm a pretty deep thinker and pretty hard on myself. So Me if too. I if I didn't um if I didn't um, give it everything. I'd be. I reckon I'd, I'd end my career pretty, pretty disappointed. How did you? How do you deal with that? Um, when you're a harsh, your, your harshest critic. Yeah. Um, and sometimes harshest critics are others are like they say they're a harsh critic, but sometimes maybe like yourself, you're a really harsh critic because yeah. you expect so much. How do you kind of make sure you don't let that take you lower? Yeah. I um. I've got a couple of examples that. Uh, so Fags used to take me into his office every now and then after a bad game or whatever, and. Um, he always used to say to me, he's like, Sam Mitchell, he's like, he was one of our best players because he was obviously from the Hawthorne era. He's like, he was one of our best players. He'd make more mistakes on field than any other player, but he was so quickly to get over him that he um, he just didn't give a fuck and he would just be so focused on getting the wow. next ball or whatever. And um, so he was always like, you need to be more like that. You're like, you need to kind of um, wipe away the mistake because you can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And then – uh, so I, I, I really, and he always used to say, um, 
you, if you dwell on your mistake, I know it shows that you care, but you're actually doing a disservice to your teammates by holding on to it. That's a great point. It's actually point. like you're actually being selfish by holding on to it. Oh, I like that analogy. Yeah, that I'm would like, snap someone yeah, like me yeah, out I'm of like, it. Like, fuck, I don't want to be, like, because I'm, I'm not a selfish That's coaching. Yeah. I'm That's not elite a coaching. Person, yeah. yeah. So uh, I remember that. And then the other thing that kind of um, has helped me as well is obviously coming to Collingwood. Um, we play such a, uh, a frantic and um, chaotic brand that we actually – like fly always talks about like we embrace mistakes. Like we actually like enjoy mistakes because it means that, um, you know, we're having a go and we mm. can, the more mistakes we can make, but the more, um, uh, gives us more opportunity to clean it up. And mm. AFL is such, it's not a, it's an imperfect game. Mm. Every single time it goes to a stoppage or whatever, it's a 50, 50 ball. And, um, it's so hard to like to maintain possession of the ball. That's why it's so good to watch, though. Yeah. yeah. So mistakes happen all the time. So the more time we can uh, we can clean up our mistakes and and be like support each other in in um, so, like uh, st- uh, like building from those mistakes, mm. the better. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. This one's from um, Deb McMasher. Who I think you might have even answered this. Who's still your closest mate from the Lions? Yeah, it'd probably be Charlie. Yeah. Um, yeah, we still talk to him pretty regularly. He, um, I actually got his wedding in September this year. Oh, no, October. Uh, it wouldn't be September. The finals are on. Yeah. <laughs> Octo- <laughs> yeah October, October, yeah. October this That's year. That's AFL so. wedding season, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. October, November. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to catching up with him. Um, uh, yeah, he's still a legend. And then probably Archie Smith as well. He, uh, he doesn't play there anymore, but um, – yeah, we're st- him and his partner and Cal and I are still like incredibly close. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, this is just a quick fire one because I forgot to ask you this, but I always ask people that go to new clubs, players that you didn't think were going to be, not necessarily didn't think were going to be elite, but when you came into Collingwood, who was like, fuck, this guy's unbelievable. A in training, A in games that maybe you didn't realize how good he was because you're obviously playing for another club. Ooh. Um, we've, all, we've had a few people from the Pies and they've all kind of had, I think Tommy Mitchell was like, he was, I think he said Josh Dacos, um, like his kicking and all that sort of stuff, like because he, yeah. he played against him a few times. But obviously then, like, you know, so I don't know if you have an example of that. Obviously Nick's naturally yeah. one you'd say, but I think you probably knew he was going to be good. So Yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't know much about Isaac Kleiner. Ah, Q. Yeah, yeah. yeah Q. He's um, just how, like, how big and strong and tough he is. And um, he's actually got really nice skills as well. Um, mm. uh, I When I was kind of – found out about him it was I, I kind of just thought he was kind of like a, a bit of a dour defender mm. but like his ability to um to run and um and break lines and um he we do like uh, how many high speed efforts you do like per game or something and he's like three times higher than any other player really? like if if like I might get like 40 or 50 or whatever he would get like 120 like he, <laughs> he's just like he's always just running his yeah. hardest so yeah, I've never um I, I like he's an incredible athlete. I've told him to tone it down, man, because he's becoming a sex icon, bro. Oh, he's like bro, fashion man. here, then you, he's got mate. the shirts off preseason. I'm like, mate, that is unbelievable. Yeah. I I said to him, and um, what have been the first time I had him on? This is a couple of years ago, but I I reckon he'll be in all Australian one day. Like yeah. I really do. I, I've he's no got doubt. the making. Like he's on his way. Like this has been a, a challenging year for a lot of players and with the injuries of pies, but mate, he's on his way there. He's yeah. a superstar. So yeah, good, absolutely. Good. Um, last one from us is we always attest three key traits to people that, you know, have success in business, sport, uh, resilience, driver, ambition, all three you need, yep. but which one for you across your 10, 11 year journey in the, in the system, um, have you sort of relied upon as your cornerstone that you wouldn't be here with without? Uh, probably resilience. Yeah. For yeah. The last eight months, especially. Yeah. 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 I learned a lot about myself in the last eight months, but even before that, like dealing with the, the pressures of moving to a club and um, and then going to Collingwood and having the, the ex- external exp- uh, expectation of that on, on your on your shoulders and um, yeah I don't I don't think I would have been able to handle it early days mm. um, it's definitely something that in the last probably two or three years I've definitely um, I'm definitely more sure of myself as a human yeah um, than I've ever been and um, it's cool when you reach that point. I don't, I don't know if it's turning 30 yeah. or just getting a bit older or whatever it is, but you just feel a little bit more, of, yeah. of, you've been through more stuff, you know who you are. Yeah. You're not trying to, um, you're not trying to fit in as, as nah, much anymore. It's just care. like, I'm, I'm just like, you I know who I am and, yeah. um, and you hope that you're a person that people will can, um, can enjoy like spending yeah. time with and respect. Uh, and yeah. respect. Yeah, yeah. So 
Definitely probably that. Well, well said, mate. It's been awesome having you on the pod. You speak Thank really you. well. Your mindset stands <laughs> out, bro. Thank you. I would not like to do a rehab program with Dan McStay uh, for everyone at home. But, hey, guys, thank you for tuning in. If you guys have come this far, please give us a subscribe to the channel. Dan McStay, what a journey. The last eight months been in a washing machine, really, with emotions. But he's back out there fitter and stronger than ever. So there's a lot of lessons in there for everyone. Um, good luck for the rest of the year, brother. Thanks, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Appreciate it. Guys, we'll see you all next week. Thank you.